It's not so because um, uh, there are supposed to be two windows and we didn't get two windows. Full screens here, we're good. Yes. Uh, you have the notes in here. And that is good, but we have a title bar. Yeah. It's not going away. Is there a right click on that one? Seen this before? Okay, now it's. Oh, I see. Well, I guess we'll have the title bar. All right. That's not too, too intrusive. Mm -hmm. uh, the last thing is this is going to give you a beep at 30 minutes. This just lets you know it's time to wrap. At 3? 30. Oh. 30 Got it. All right, so let's get started. So, hello, OpenStack Summit. <laughs> I mean, Open Infra Summit. It's nice to be back at the summit after such a long break. We and the, the SEF team are very attached to OpenStack, so it's nice to meet you all in person again. So uh, my marketing manager had a long history of saying that you have to introduce yourself, otherwise it's malpractice. Those are things I worked on in the past. Um, so I've had the privilege of spending basically my entire career in open source, aside for a brief stint in academia. I'm the product management director for the Ceph platform at IBM and at Red Hat. And previously, I was the Ubuntu server PM at Canonical. And if you round out the decade, I was the dreaded systems management czar at SUSE. That was my actual title. Um, I was the maintainer of MAN for a very long time. And um, I wrote a book by O'Reilly about AWS, which is why the picture looks funny like that. And I think that's enough about me. So. Security. This is a pretty advanced session. We have the obligatory introduction notes, but this is Ceph day. It's the afternoon. If you don't know what Ceph is by this point, see me afterwards for cliff notes. Um, similar thing for Rook. You should have absorbed something about Rook, but um, here the focus is OpenStack, so maybe you didn't. Rook is 
a Kubernetes operator for Ceph. And essentially, it manages Ceph clusters running on a Kubernetes uh, fabric. That's the way you should think of it. It's interesting because it automates some of the day-to-day -day management or it encapsulates multiple options in ways that are not possible outside of a containerized and virtualized environment. So that's another interesting component that we use all the time. So now let's go to the actual security. Um, let's dive right in. Now, what is security? Security hardens a specific point of the infrastructure. That is what security best practices do. Cherry picking practices without a model of the, threat, of the threat and of the attacker that you're worrying about is not a viable strategy. It's like saying that everything is a priority, which is the same thing as saying that nothing is. So you have to decide, instead of having, um, um, and let's not be meaning to management, but instead of saying management like things that result in everything is a priority, you have to have an actual, uh, an actual priority, something that is actually meaningful. Otherwise, you will wind up in scenarios like cover your computer in concrete and bury it at the bottom of the ocean because you have to stop every possible imaginable thing, which is not very useful, clearly. So. Are you facing script kiddies at one end of the spectrum, the GRU, the Russian Secret Service, at the other? These are very different threat models. Some attackers want to steal your data. Others don't care about your data. They just want to um, en encrypt it and crypto, um, hold you for ransom, crypto lock you for ransom, as they say now. Um, others may be just satisfied with complete disruption, bringing you down, and it doesn't matter where the data is or if you have it or not. So for these reasons, you have to decide who is in your threat model and who isn't. Typically, the worst case scenario is the privileged insider, somebody that is inside your security perimeter and has root credentials. If you have that in your security profile, then um, you're going to have some very interesting challenges to deal with. Now, once you have this, you have, uh, you have the basic framework to make choices. And so let's start from the network. In Ceph, the network is segmented in multiple logical networks. Um, the public security zone is an entirely untrusted area of the cloud. It could be in the internet as a whole, or just networks external to your cluster that you have no authority over. Data transmissions crossing the public security zone should make use of encryption. Note uh, that the public zone, as I just defined it, does not include the storage cluster front end, the Ceph public underscore network. That's an unfortunate naming, but it, that is a different thing that it defines the storage front end and properly belongs in what is called the storage access zone. So anyway, um, the Ceph client zone next refers to networks accessing Ceph clients. These could be um, the object gateway, for example, the Ceph file system or block storage. Ceph clients are not always excluded from the public security zone for instance, it is possible to expose the object gateways, S3 or Swift APIs in the public security zone. That's exceedingly common. Next is uh, the storage access zone. That is an internal network providing Ceph clients with access to the storage cluster itself. And finally, uh, the cluster zone refers to the most internal network and that provides storage nodes with connectivity for replication, heartbeat, backfill, recovery tasks. This zone includes the Ceph cluster's backend network called the cluster underscore network there in Ceph. And um, operators often run clear text um, traffic in the cluster zone because they rely on the physical separation of, the, of this network. Um, or on the logical separation, usually this is on a VLAN at the very least. 
This, again, going back to previous comments, this would not be a valid choice, for example, if in privileged insider is in your threat model, because the privileged insider very likely would have the keys to the cabinet, can go in and tap this network. But if, um, if your threat model doesn't include that, then you can have the performance of a cluster that doesn't encrypt its internal communication if you're not worried about people putting a network tap inside your rack. So again, everything is on the threat model first. These four zones are separately mapped or combined depending on the use case and the threat model in use. Now, components spanning the boundary of two security zones, which are demons in Ceph, um, two security zones with um, different trust or authentication requirements must be carefully configured. These are the natural, um, maybe not weak points, but they're the natural points to attack when you're trying to escalate privileges. You've got access to one network, you're trying to hop into a more privileged one. And so the crossover points should always be configured to meet the requirements of the zone that has, um, of the zone with the highest um, uh, security requirements or the higher level of trust, if you want to think about it in those terms. In many cases, um, the security controls should be a primary concern due to the likelihood of these components being pro probed and the possibility that you just uh, fat finger some configuration thing and, and you create a passage between two security zones by misconfiguring the, the way things are set up. Operators should consider exceeding zone requirements at integration points. Um, which usually it's an empty thing to say because, again, you have to be able to use the technology that you're deploying. But in storage is actually often a possibility. Um, storage is a little bit simpler in this regard than compute. And so if your storage use case gives you the possibility of ratcheting up the configuration security of the integration points, by all means, that's a good hardening practice. For example, here, um, let's say the cluster zone can be isolated from other zones easily because there is no reason for it to connect to other zones. Conversely, an object gateway in the client security zone instead needs access to a lot of things. The monitors, ports are six, seven, eight, nine, uh, all the OSDs on port 6800 to 7300 uh, to access the actual data storage will likely expose the S3 API to the public security zone, ports 18 and 443. So some things you can't close, but there are plenty of things that you can. So that's, those are the low hanging fruit. Now, uh, normally I'm joined by um, Sage McTaggart, who leads our security team, uh, but uh, they could not be here uh, today. The thing about product security that is interesting in Ceph is that, as you heard yesterday, we have transferred Ceph internally to the, uh, between the IBM and Red Hat boundaries. We moved the Ceph team from Red Hat to IBM. So now we are uh, looking at IBM product security, not Red Hat, which is slightly different. Um, if possible, even more paranoid is my impression. So from the point of view of the customer, that is good. It's, um, you may get more patches, but it doesn't matter because the deployment model is containerized. So when you get one container, how many uh, security fixes have been addressed in the container is really not that relevant. So uh, potentially, if it doesn't slow us down to fix uh, things that in the past we wouldn't have considered relevant because they were not accessible in a storage system, like vulnerability in the, usually the canonical example is saying that there is a vulnerability in the printer driver in RHEL, and how does that matter when you're running storage on top of that? Um, IBM tends to be very strict about what is in the images. So we've become stricter about uh, purging the images with dependencies that we're not using. They're not accessible, but it's fairly easy to just uninstall these things that are in the stock uh, RHEL image that we start from. 
and we're probably going to be shipping uh, more fixes for things that are uh, rated medium or lower in the CVEs. I don't think that it changes things much, but it's, it's uh, better or same, right? So that's probably the most visible change. Um, let me see. Um, the new uh, uh, team is called Product Security. Um, but um, because we're still getting revved up in terms of what processes uh, we're adding as part of IBM compared to Red Hat, we're trying not to say things that then don't happen later. So bear with us as we figure it out. The general line is that it's going to be same or better in terms of security. Um, generally speaking, the standard for Red Hat is that vulnerabilities are addressed if they are exploitable. Otherwise, Red Hat tries to minimize the number of fixes that ship uh, to reduce the noise in terms of what the operators have to manage um, in terms of the constant stream of updates. As I already mentioned, IBM takes a different take, and it tends to be, if it exists, patch it. So um, that is probably the most visible difference. Um, we are getting more disciplined in terms of doing penetration testing and regular scans. I don't think I can tell you how often just yet, but, uh, but it's more often than in the past, which is nice. Um, and of course, nothing changes in terms of our relationship with upstream. Everything that we fix is, goes to upstream first, so any CVE that we address is available in the community project, uh, just as is in the products. So uh, let's move on to encryption. Server side, uh, operators overwhelmingly choose to encrypt data at rest using the Linux, um, and using the LAX mechanism. All data and metadata of a Ceph storage cluster can be um, secured using a variety of dmcrypt configurations, and nearly all, uh, nearly all of the existing Red Hat customers choose to. I stopped tracking how popular was uh, at rest encryption in 2015 because at that point it was already overwhelmingly over 50%. It's a given that at rest the data is encrypted, the OSD is encrypted, period. Uh, we're at the point where actually replacing encrypted drives is a single operation in Ceph ADM, and it's a very simple workflow in the dashboard, so that all the configuration mechanisms that need to take place when you are taking a dead drive out and putting a new one in are, are all handled for you. Um, we also have a, best, a security best practice of locating the monitors on separate hosts from the storage daemons. Uh, this is because the, uh, the, uh, the at rest encryption keys are kept in the monitors. So that way, by having anti-affinity, if somebody steals one machine of your cluster, they either have the keys or they have the data, but they don't have both. They need to take two machines or the right two machines to be proper. So this obviously is not possible at the edge where you overlay everything in three nodes. But for normal Ceph clusters with seven nodes, 11 nodes, or hundreds of nodes, this very much makes sense. Um, and there is one other thing that I get asked about all the time, which is, okay, the, well, no, actually I get asked only by the Washington DC crowd, but since this is the OpenStack crowd, you're on the same technical level. Um, what happens with the keys that are uh, being kept by the monitor? How are those secured? Those are at rest on the file system of the monitor. So the file system of the monitor should be also de-encrypted. The, the Linux boot partition should be de-encrypted. And then it's in the hands of however you secure the boot up of your machines, right? In your data center, you've already solved that problem of how to authenticate at boot up, it applies there as well. Um, encryption wise, the object store uh, gateway has additional capabilities, including encryption at ingestion time. So you can um, have RGW encrypted data as it comes in, 
rather than locks encrypting it as it gets stored on the file system. The difference there is a little bit academic. The part that is interesting is that you can think of it as when you're encrypting the data at rest, the keys are managed by the cluster operator and they're, they're centrally managed and they are per machine keys. When you're having encryption done at RGW, the keys are uh, per user keys and they're managed by the user. So that's the biggest, uh, most relevant difference. Um, key rotation with tools like Vault is supported in RGW. Uh, there is support, or support for Amazon AWS SSC, uh, SSE KMS, and there are more things coming. Further, you can use a uh, Department of Defense certified uh, cryptography under FIPS 142, and this year we hope FIPS 143, as supplied by RHEL in the version that you're deploying. So if you if you use RHEL, you know that there is a mode you install RHEL in that's called FIPS mode. It only gives you Department of Defense cryptography in that case. And uh, Ceph very strictly only uses crypto from the operating system. So at that point, Ceph is also using um, certified crypto. Um, encryption in transit now. So <clears throat> for encryption in transit, um, a network communication can be secured by turning on a, the Ceph protocol encryption in the Messenger v2.1 protocol or later, a protocol that was introduced with Nautilus. Now, here it's different than at rest. Um, network communication in clear text may be fine. The extreme case was the one that I was giving you, the internal network that the class and their nodes are using to replicate data is very often physically secured with its own NICs. So if your threat model doesn't include someone that has the keys to the cabinet, there is no need to purchase additional CPUs and, uh, and RAM to just encrypt traffic between the nodes themselves. The most common scenario where that kind of communication gets encrypted is corporate policy. We have some customers, I believe one is in France, I think it's, a, it's due to a French regulator, and um, a couple of others, mostly in Europe, that are adopting policies that say we encrypt everything no matter what. So from the point of view of the operations team, if what is happening between the Ceph nodes in one cluster is regarded as network communication, the operations team may decide that it's actually better to buy a few more CPUs and a little bit of RAM rather than slugging it out with their security team for an exception there. So most of the network encryption that we see for the Ceph protocol is coming from that kind of compliance reason. Um, but there are plenty of cases where it's actually necessary for, uh, for actual practical security reasons. CephFS talks to the entire uh, set of OSDs RBD talks to the entire set of OSDs. If the clients are transiting any network that is less than 100% locked out, it makes sense to encrypt that. In the OpenStack specific scenario, this has been addressed for years in a slightly different way, which is that um, in the Nova VM, you deploy the encrypt to encrypt the file system of the VM internally. And then all the communication from the virtual disk of the Nova VM to Ceph is in the clear in terms of Ceph protocol, but the payload is the encrypted data. So you have perhaps not ideal because you're using at rest encryption for in-flight data. So maybe some uh, cryptanalyst, cryptanalyst may wrap my knuckles, but in general, that is how OpenStack has done it for all this time. And, uh, and it's worked just perfectly fine. However, if you want, you can in, replace the encrypt at rest in the VM and use um, a Messenger v2 encryption instead. It's a little bit of, uh, it's logical that you use the encrypt in the VM because you want to encrypt the, um, the VM at rest anyway. So you kind of get um, two birds with one stone there or 
I think with one scone is the new way to say it. Um, by encrypting both the, the VM at rest and, um, and the network protocol. But that is very OpenStack specific. Uh, how much does this encryption cost is the other question. And so you have to size the cluster. If you're going to encrypt the in-flight protocol, you're going to have to size RAM and especially CPU to account for these overheads. Um, in most cases, the performance uh, impact is not that significant. You have to account f for it in the cluster architecture, but in terms of the overall user performance, you are going to see the same performance because uh, there is no significant enough latency that is not overshadowed by the latency of network communication. So we usually don't see other slowness. You just need a little bit more hardware when you design the cluster. Uh, things vary between large block sizes and small block sizes, but that's, that's a general heuristic. All right, looking at more specific protocols, uh, the S3 service is usually secured between RGW and the S3 client with TLS uh, on port 443, obviously. Also, it is possible to serve plain HTTP on port 80 for some reason you want to do that. Um, I guess for some services that may be desirable, maybe you don't want to encrypt images or something like that. But um, the interesting bit is that TLS termination at HA, HA proxy is a special case. So TLS would end at HA proxy, then HA proxy needs to talk to RGW. That hop is in the clear. You have to account for that in your security model. Um, the other thing that's generally applicable is that standard practices like maintaining the firewall of all your nodes rather than the firewall around the cluster, but individually firewalling the nodes so that they don't expose things that are that is not necessary to expose is, a, is an obvious best practice and that should be absolutely followed. Now, Rook specifics. So, um, this is a little bit of um, Kubernetes bombardment, so I, I apologize if you're not too familiar with that. Uh, but it's only one slide. <laughs> uh, Rook can use CRDs, custom resource definitions, to encode many settings, like configuring trust certificates uh, for the Rados Gateway web server. Um, Rook supports at rest data encryption as we discussed earlier, uh, with in-flight Ceph protocol encryption management being added in 1.9. Rook is essentially a management tool, so you see there usually a little bit of latency between Ceph versions and support for it in Rook. Uh, the Kubernetes user permission system applies to PVs, persistent, Kubernetes persistent volumes. Um, so permissions, quotas, and all the other accoutrements that come with Kubernetes storage management are all there. Rook doesn't need to do anything for that. Um, Rook also support uh, key management systems in the CSI interface, uh, allowing individual volumes to be encrypted with their own key. Um, this kind of helps a little bit with managing key rotation, revocation, and limiting the scope uh, of each key. Control plane. So how do you manage uh, this? Um, uh, this is uh, very standard. Uh, as popularized by Ansible, SSH is used by CephADM, and so Ceph ADM, Ceph Ansible, and other uh, deployment tools or one day one tools uh, tend to be SSH centric. So that's something that everybody tends to be very familiar with. Uh, these provide um, paths for install and upgrade management as, uh, as part of host management. Um, and then uh, on the management dashboard, there is, a, and there is a thing that is interesting in terms of being another decision. 
you have to decide where, where you're placing the dashboard in terms of what network. You can place the dashboard in a fairly secluded network inside of Ceph, where only the Ceph administrator can reach it. You can put it in a more public network where it's more accessible within your corporate infrastructure. It's a little bit more accessible. Uh, that is something that different users choose to do differently. It's, it's one of the decisions you must make. Um, ultimately, it needs to be reachable by the operator's workstation to be useful, right? But where is the operator workstation is, is variable depending on who the customer is. Uh, the manager is, uh, is the daemon that provides a significant number of, um, or mostly all of the functionality on the dashboard. So um, that needs to be reachable by, to have the dashboard accessible. All right, more on identity and access. Cephex is the uh, internal um, identity system that Ceph uses. Um, its use of shared secret keys protects clusters from man-in-the-middle attacks by default. Um, uh, but good practices still apply here. So uh, good practice is to uh, grant the keyring read and write permissions only for the current user and the root, with client admin users restricted to root only. Um, and that limits what user can pretend to be a root, essentially. Talking about RGW, um, RGW supports the key and secret model of AWS that most of us are already familiar with, so nothing too surprising there. It also supports the security model of OpenStack Swift as it needs to be a drop-in replacement for Swift. Of course, the administrator's key and secret need to be treated with the appropriate respect, and that's no big surprise. Uh, use full uh, root privilege keys, or administrative keys, if you want to call them that way, uh, sparingly to reduce uh, risk profile. Uh, RGW's user data is stored in Ceph pools. So and that should be discussed, uh, secured as we discussed previously with data at rest. And um, you have to consider this um, user data, so you should be aware of it. You can, um, you can integrate um, identity providers from your organization to provide identities to RGW so that you don't need to create a whole set of users just for RGW. You can obviously import, um, you can obviously import the users from your uh, corporate identity vault. Uh, with identity and access, we support LDAP uh, and Active Directory users. We recommend secure LDAP. And obviously, in the OpenStack context, we support Keystone um, for um, OpenStack clouds. In auditing, um, a lot of operations are audited. There shouldn't be anything um, touchy there. But it is considered the best practice to uh, regularly purge your logs so that you don't leave too much data behind should aggregate your logs in a central location, like Arsys log or Splunk or whatever it is, and pur purge them lo locally um, out of an exceeding level of paranoia. Uh, data retention is an interesting one. Um, once data is deleted from a Ceph cluster, you generally cannot do anything with it. However, uh, there are exceptions. Uh, RBD is a trash bin where dynamic use of spare capacity uh, can be used to retain deleted images. Um, for a certain number of days or until policy, um, until the space is uh, reclaimed. Uh, RGW has versioned buckets, so you retain data as part of previous versions of objects that you have deleted. If you don't want to retain data inadvertently, you have to configure these things correctly so that they don't retain data for you when you don't want to keep it around. Additionally, like in almost any storage medium, individual data blocks 
used to constitute an object are still there on the disk platters, and you certainly cannot overwrite a Ceph cluster by writing a lot of data to it. It's not going to work. At least it's not going to work reliably, which is what, you're, uh, what you want to do. So the sanitization or the secure deletion practice is um, use a, a hard drive encryption, like we discussed before, for other reasons. When you want to sanitize the drive, you throw away the key. And the fact that now there are drives that do this on, in hardware make things even easier. You don't need to, uh, you don't even need to manage the keys yourself. Hardening options are very vendor dependent. Uh, these are the Red Hat options, and obviously, uh, consequently, also the IBM options. Uh, others may vary. Now, we're not going to go into a discussion of GCC and kernel security options, and, but if you're lucky enough that you don't know what these things are, um, you can learn more by looking at uh, documentation from the Ubuntu kernel team. They have a very nice table of all of these. So once you know what they are, <laughs> then you can decide whether you need them or not. It doesn't really, for most people, um, well, maybe this is, this is OpenStack after all, but for most people, you, we don't go out compiling new binaries. We don't have the time to do that. But you should be aware of what the security level is. So you go and study and as such. Now that is it. Uh, there are some more reading things for you available, covering the things that we haven't covered. Kubernetes secrets are always um, a hot topic, especially rook-related. So hacking Kubernetes by O'Reilly and uh, a tutorial by Rani Osnat at Aqua Security cover that in detail. Uh, our product, uh, Red Hat Ceph Storage and IBM uh, Storage Ceph, have a dedicated hardening guide that expands what I was describing in, uh, in long form. Kubernetes documentation has a very nice treatment of encrypting data at rest, and again, those mysterious options from GCC for the hardening of binaries are also documented. Um, uh, these are all the people that have contributed to the presentation so far, and um, that's it for today. Are there any questions?